Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Workers' Mic right here on 720 WGN. It's brought to you by the Midwest Coalition of Labor. And I am Ed Maher with the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. And I've got with me today Phil Davidson from the Mid-America Carpenters Union. Thank you uh, for coming in today, Phil. Welcome. Good morning, Ed. Great to be back. Absolutely. Filling in for Ken. Well, Ken's not here. He's the new Where's Waldo. Where is he now? Uh, I think he's in New Jersey. Oh, okay. You know, or no, he's in uh, uh, Philadelphia. That's where it is. Scoping out the worst. Jersey seems fans. more fitting for him, but we'll go with Philadelphia. Ouch. <laughs> I didn't have a hand in that one, Ken. Um, but uh, how are you doing this weekend? Doing, uh, I'm doing well. Yeah, um, yeah nice, uh, quiet weekend. Getting back in the swing of things after the holiday last weekend. Um, yeah. So yeah, everything's good. How about you? Nice, I'm good. I'm still exhausted. Uh, I was walking around Costco for, you know, two and a half hours yesterday, spending absolutely all my money on mattress toppers and really big bags of corn chips and, you know, whatever. I'm jealous, man. You know Any two hours right spent now. at Costco sounds like heaven to me. At, at least, least they yeah. feed you. <laughs> they, at least they do feed you. Yeah. For I, 99 cents. Yeah, the, yes. the 99 cent hot dogs, you know, it's the, and they haven't raised the prices. And the leaders, the the founder of Costco was in a board meeting once when I think the, the new CEO was trying to, uh, he suggested increasing the price on the hot dogs and the founder's statement in the meeting on the record was, I'll kill you <laughs> if you touch the price on those hot dogs. It's going to be 99 cents. We lose money on it. We know we don't care. Um, he literally threatened violence? He said, I'll kill you. You can look it up. It's But, it, you know, it, it, that would uh, we can support that sort of sentiment, I think, because yeah. he was doing it to help people eat on the cheap. and uh, Looking out for the working man. Right. And Costco actually was in the news this past week because they were they had an earnings call and they were talking about the inflationary impact and you know how much more it costs for them to buy all their goods and a an analyst from UBS an investment bank said isn't this the time to raise your membership fees and the CFO of Costco said nice try we're eating at least 2 to 3% of the inflationary cost before we pass any product cost increase on to the customers and we're not touching this he said something along the lines of we need to be a beacon of uh, during this time when people are having so much trouble affording things. We need to help them rather than just see it as an opportunity to to jack up prices. And I took a look, and uh, uh, Costco's stock is up like nine percent on the year. So, as it turns out, um, you know, making sure your customers can afford to shop at your store is good business, good for the bottom line. So, um, you God know, shout Costco. out to Costco. Yeah. So let that be a lesson, everyone else. Right on. Um, so we've got a couple of guests coming in today. We've got Dave Sullivan. Uh, he's a lobbyist, uh, former uh, state senator on the Republican side of the aisle, uh, just an all-around great guy. We've also got Mark Polis, the executive director of the Indiana Illinois Iowa Foundation for Fair Contracting, uh, who works you know across the the labor movement in the state of Illinois. They're both going to be coming in. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about, so uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll have Dave and Mark in the studio with us. So stay with us here Can't on wait. 720 WGN. We'll be right back with the Worker's Mic. Welcome back, everybody, to the Worker's Mic right here on 720 WGN. So in the earlier segment, we uh, told you we had some uh, illustrious guests today. So uh, we are back, and I'm going to introduce our guests. We've got Dave Sullivan, and he is a lobbyist. Um, and also, an interesting thing to note, he's a former Republican state senator. He has a multitude of clients, including labor unions, the film industry. Um, and he is the last Republican senator to serve a part of the city of Chicago. Is that right? I am, Ed. Yep. Good morning. Well, Good to see you. Good I know morning. you're a fan welcome. of the show. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and then we've also got Mark Polis. Mark is the executive director of the Indiana, Illinois, Illinois Iowa Foundation for Fair Contracting. So, Good morning, Ed. What's yeah, it's a mouthful. Mark? That is kind of a mouthful. But uh, um, what, Dave, why don't we uh, start off with you a little bit. What, uh, as, a, as a labor lobbyist in the state of Illinois, what do you do? Well, first of all, Ed, I'm thrilled to be here on what is kind of a trifecta weekend, I think, for Chicago. Mm -hmm. It's the beginning of Pride Month, so happy Pride. Mm -hmm. And we have Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy and Taylor Swift both in town. Pretty big weekend for Chicago. 
Perfect I, storm right there. I'm triple booked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know go. where I need to be. Quite a trifecta. Um, so I, I served in the Senate from the northwest suburbs and the northwest side of Chicago. Loved it. It was a great experience. Uh, back in the old days when a guy named Barack Obama served in the Senate, mm-hmm. um, we played poker with, with each other a couple times. Uh, uh, great president, maybe not the best poker player you've ever met. but, but Back Barack, when Democrats Bar- and Republicans <laughs> played poker together. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, we had a great time. Um, and then my kids started to go to college mm-hmm. and public service and paying for your kids to go to college does not work well together. So I retired. They went to Marquette, my alma mater, great mm-hmm. place, but uh, needed, to, needed to do something else. So I became a lobbyist. I lobby for the Operating en- Engineers, Local 150, mm-hmm. which is, a, as you know, great yep. organization. Um, the, our other union client is the Chicago Fraternal Order of Police here in Chicago. Another dull client, never anything going on with them. So never, that, that, yeah, never. Yeah, absolutely. You take um, the easy ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you betcha. <laughs> um, and we, we lobby for a variety of different entities from Equality Illinois, um, gay rights organization, to uh, the United Center and the White Sox, to the bankers, um, and, and Cinespace, where they film. Hopefully they can start filming again once that strike's over. Yep. Um, a lot of films are in the Chicago area, so glad to be here. Thanks, Ed. Now, one of the most illustrious awards you can get in the state of Illinois in politics is the Golden Horseshoe, and that's uh, the Golden Horseshoe for Best Lobbyist. It's voted on by your peers, and you've won that before. Is that right? I, I have, and I think Rich Miller from Capital Facts will be thrilled to hear you describe that. Describe it that way. I'm oh, honored, I, honored to receive it. Absolutely, yeah. and a, yeah. a fellow honoree, I believe, is sitting right next to you. He is multi-time winner. That's so, Mark, right. again, the executive director of the Foundation for Fair Contracting here. Um, and uh, tell us a little bit about what that entails. Sure, Ed. Uh, so I've been uh, in that position for about uh, just about 20 years now. Uh, I run the labor management organization, so everything outside of collective bargaining uh, that comes up between the uh, employers, uh, typically contractors and uh, operating engineers, Local 150 Union. I've uh, been doing that for uh, you know some time. A lot of that involves uh, a lot of what Dave just talked about, which is lobby work, right? Mm-hmm. At the local level, at the city level, at the state level, at the federal level. Um, you know, uh, uh, operating engineers live and breathe by uh, going to work. Uh, building roads, building bridges, building buildings, uh, you name it, uh, you know, restoring the infrastructure uh, that is so badly needed uh, in this country. So that's probably the the main focus uh, of what my career has been over the last 20 years. So in a, in a lobbying perspective, because I know you do some, some governmental work also, you've got to focus on finding common ground and bringing people to, uh, together. Um, and that's got to be a challenge with construction business owners and union leaders, but something that you've you've got to do every day, if I'm not mistaken. For sure. Yeah, the the labor management. So my board is made up of 50-50. So half of the board uh, for the last 20 years has been uh, contractor associations. Uh, and then the other half of the board uh, are uh, union trustees. So, you know, you've got to get to a consensus on, you know, supporting particular candidates or, or particular issues. Uh, and uh, that only happens if you get a majority vote. So it always requires a kind of sort of, you know, reach across uh, the aisle, whether it's, uh, you know, union or contractors or reach across the aisle, whether it's Democrats or Republicans. What's the, I was going to ask quickly, what, for either one of you, Mark or Dave, when you're working with the elected officials, what are the biggest gaps in their knowledge when it comes to lobbying on behalf of a union? Where, where is the most education needed for them uh, to explain what uh, we're trying to do here? Well, I can tell you as a, as a former legislator, you have to know a, something about a lot of different topics. Mm-hmm. You're not an expert on many things, but you have to know a, enough to talk about it and, and be knowledgeable about how you're going to vote on it. So legislators really re- require lobbyists and different trade associations, unions, business groups to help educate them so that they can cast the vote that they're comfortable with. I mean, a, a legislator needs to be able to go back to their district and defend their vote, whatever the vote was, yes or no, on whatever the topic was, and lobbyists really help educate them. The legislator has to take that vote. It's, it's their vote, but right. we, we help them get through that process. And lobbying, I mean, I think sometimes the term lobbyist probably, um, you know, evokes different uh, emotions from different people. But lobbying is not a long term gig. You can't survive as a lobbyist if you're not honest, because if somebody says I'm going to vote on something and I'm going to trust that you're telling me the truth and you get the vote and then it turns out you made the whole thing up, you're done in the business. It's a. If you don't have your integrity, you've got nothing, right? Well, there you go, Ed. I, I think the last question really was twofold, uh, and and part of the answer to that question is, um, you know, unions have a duty to um, uh, educate you know legislators or elected officials on things that are important to them, right? Yep. Um, but but the other part of it too is um, it takes a certain level of a relationship and trust. Um, you know, if if 
if you build that relationship with the legislator and you build that trust with them and you're telling them this is what the bill is and this is what the issue is and here's how we're going to resolve it, if you've got that level of trust, they're, they're going to trust you. Yeah. Um, and if you're telling them the truth, the next time, right, you just keep continue to build on that trust. So, you know, I think there's a, a lot to be said about building those relationships and building that trust. Um, I'll, I'll say that every time the um, the the legislature turns over right the house every two years. I mean, we'll get sometimes twenty or thirty new members that come in that you know literally came from an elected school board. Mm -hmm. um, some came as just uh, uh, you know a mom raising a, a bunch of kids. Um, uh, some of them are a dad raising a bunch of kids. Right? They're just you know your next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it takes a certain amount of time to um, you know meet them, build that relationship. But you know, it really comes down to the trust. Yeah, and that trust factor is is so important. You know, as Mark referenced that more than half of the current legislature has less than five years experience. So there's a lot wow. of new legislators out there and they have to trust their colleagues, they have to trust us. And I describe it as we, we swim in a small pond, mm -hmm. you know, to your point about if you don't have you know, your honesty, you're, you're not gonna last long, yep. people will talk. If, if someone misleads somebody else, it's gonna be found out pretty quickly. It's, it's a bad plan. Right. Well, on the show, we've talked a lot over the, you know, over the past year or so about what's happening in other states and some of the, the things that are happening in, say, Iowa with uh, their child labor laws. They're now trying to expand child labor laws in Wisconsin, in Ohio. Uh, they've done it in New Jersey. It's happening all over the country. And we don't see that type of uh, that type of thing happening in Illinois. And, you know, some of the like Ohio right now is trying to pass a bill that, uh, bans uh, higher education strikes and it's buried in this thing where they're trying to ban bias in the classroom uh, which I guess is a very broad definition uh, ban diversity uh, education in the classroom and colleges and then at the bottom it's also banning teacher strikes so um, they're just attacking workers and uh, we don't necessarily see that quite so much in the state of Illinois and uh, when we have pro-worker um, things on the agenda like the workers rights amendment and uh, things like that, we tend to have some bipartisan agreement, um, you know, which you don't see in, in many places in the Midwest. So, um, I mean, Dave, why do you think that is? Why do you think, what makes Illinois different? I think a big part of what makes Illinois different is the Republicans and Democrats, they, you know, they're obviously not going to agree on everything. There's mm -hmm. many things they just disagree on, but they try to work together whenever possible. I mean, we're, we're fortunate that Governor Pritzker and Senate President Harmon and Speaker Welch are all in for worker rights. They, they just all are. So you start with a strong Democrat base. The Republican leaders, the, certainly the, the current two, Leader Curran in the Senate and Leader McCombie in, in the House, are very pro-labor. Um, they're not going to agree with everything that, that labor has to say, but they really want to work together. And I think they view the management and the labor kind of the way Mark's organization is. They view it as a partnership mm -hmm. that you, you don't need to be fighting with each other. You shouldn't be fighting with each other whenever possible. You really need to work together. And so we've got a lot of Republican le uh, legislators starting out with their leaders who view the worker relationship with business as a partnership, not as adversarial. Right. And I mean, we saw with the results to the Workers' Rights Amendment, Mark, um, that uh, that amendment last November outperformed every statewide candidate in the Republican Party and the Democrat Party in every county in the state of Illinois. So there was no statewide candidate that was more popular than the Workers' Rights Amendment with Democrats or with Republicans. So um, pro-worker policies, it's just good politics, am I right? Yeah, well, I, I, I think that amendment and the outcome of that um, kind of sort of tracks what you just said, which is, you know, Illinois is different. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, both Democrats and Republicans up and down the state, both elected officials and just, you know, your norm, normal average everyday Joe who's going to vote, um, you know, they, they believe in a strong collective bargaining state. Um, and with that said, you know, they believe in a, in a strong labor base, right, that's going to be good for the economy, that's going to be good for the state of Illinois, unlike, as you mentioned, uh, other states like Iowa or even Indiana, certainly Missouri, mm -hmm. um, and even to a certain extent, uh, you know, Wisconsin and, you know, things have turned around in Michigan, but right. you know, things went south even in, a, you know, the home of the UA uh, and, and even in Wisconsin, right, which was the birthplace of AFSCME, right? I mean, these places uh, uh, since the 2010 mid midterm elections, right? So, you know, 12 years later, uh, you know, have passed things like right to work and rolled back prevailing wage and passed things like Act 10, which was stripping all of the collective bargaining rights from teachers and everybody else and just kind of sort of left it down to uh, what do you make as a salary and can't negotiate against anything else. And Illinois has just taken the other route, right. which is to strengthen collective bargaining. 
Well, it seemed like um, back when states were rushing to pass right to work, if they had the votes to do it, they were just going to do it. It was all about opportunism and D's fighting against R's, R's fighting against D's. And the whole reason that everyone was brought there to represent their constituents was entirely forgotten. I mean, people just became collateral damage of whatever one party could do to the other party. Um, but I was going to ask Mark, uh, in the region, I mean, how are these other states? There have been some positive changes in, in Michigan, I know. I think Wisconsin's trying to turn things around with their new Supreme Court justice. But uh, how's the rest of the Midwest looking? Well, uh, it, it's still not looking great. Um, you know, we've we've made some strides, uh, I think, in the state of Indiana, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got strong bipartisan relationships there. We have for years. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a long road. I mean, you got to remember, Indiana at one point was not a right-to-work state. Mm -hmm. uh, it was then a right-to-work state. Uh, it was then removed as a non-right-to-work state, right. and then it became a right-to-work state, right? And so, if I mean, we they, can change it back to a non-right-to-work <laughs> state, we are going right. to do it. So, right, that's the plan. Uh, so you I mean, you I mean right-to-work for less. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right. The, yeah, the nomenclature of uh, right-to-work, right, was this old, you know, 50, 60, 70-year-old uh, policy brought to you by uh, kind of the deep conservative right wing, which, you know, listen, it, it worked for yep. them, right? We would have done the same thing if we found – it's kind of like the workers' rights, right? Uh, it's a good when, name. When, it, yeah, boy, when you looked at the workers' rights – yeah. Uh, uh, many tried to spin it as Amendment 1, which right. yeah. it was not, mm -hmm. uh, because they hated the fact that everybody was walking around talking about the Workers' Rights Amendment. Who right. could possibly be, be right. against workers' rights? So, you know, there is a, a valid point to that, right? They won with the, the right-to-work nomenclature. We won with the workers' well, rights, workers rights uh, yeah. nomenclature. But uh, but back to, back to your point about the Midwest, um, you know, remember, too, there was, you know, some of these states that were taking these deep turns uh, against labor, you know, take Indiana, for example. I mean, Mitch Daniels was eyeing the White House, right? right. He was mm -hmm. given the playbook by the, you know, Koch brothers and the Mackinac uh, uh, Policy Institute and others. And then you also had Walker up in Wisconsin, right? The eye on the presidency, right? They were following the roadmap where they were told. Yeah. These were things that had to be done in mm -hmm. order to be considered uh, by the, the, the money makers uh, on the right. And, you know, uh, I hope people took notice, but boy, they, they, they did all those things. And then how did it turn out for him? Well, right. for Mitch Daniels, not all so bad, right? The guy was like president of Purdue, Purdue pulling yeah. down yeah, probably no, five bills a year. So, <laughs> yeah. right. Not the worst play. No, thing the world. I'm sure yeah. Walker's doing just fine as well. Yeah. Um, but in any event, there is a, there is a certain aspect to that, that, um, you know, this was, this was much bigger than what was good or bad for a state. It mm -hmm. was kind of sort of what was good or bad for them and what they thought as right. a country. Yeah. So it, it was, it was, you know, I think that, that movement, over the last decade was was much more about that. And I, full full, like, full, like full disclosure, idea. Uh, Scott Walker is an old college buddy of mine from Marquette. No way. I, you is, know, I know he was yeah, a roommate, but uh, you never he never said he was, was not. Buddy. He, he was not my roommate, but he's, oh, okay. he, he's an old friend. I these days I try to remind him that even though he's a Brewers fan, his wise mother is a Cubs fan. Got I'm just going to say, if Illinois had to get one of the two of you, I'm glad we got you. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> For sure. I, I have noticed though, just on a, on a national level, it, it seems like um, in Part of this might be because of Donald Trump, but there is more of an awareness and more um, consideration for the workers amongst the Republican Party. Because obviously it's always been more of we were business friendly, Democrats have been more worker friendly. But right. if, if you look at the polling, like your average voter now is much more on the left from an economic fiscal standpoint. And, you know, they're not there, you know, the, the people especially who don't have college degrees they're not there to like support the robber barons they're there to support right. the guys the blue collar guys and i think that message is seems to be permeating now amongst they some finally of, figured it they out figured if it you out stop killing yeah. the people who <laughs> right. vote for you yes you know they'll continue to vote for yeah. you yeah now obviously it's been contradicted in some of our surrounding states but it seems like right. the winds are changing a little bit uh, well, well, i don't know so. if you could speak to that well just david mark yeah. yeah well i'd say just remember yeah. that um you know well a couple things uh first of all there is not a worker shortage right. in places where you have strong workers' compensation, where you have strong protections under unemployment insurance, where you have strong minimum wage standards, where you have strong prevailing wage standards, where you have uh, uh, strong collective bargaining, right? I mean, take the operating engineers, for example. I mean, their apprenticeship site opens up uh, once a year mm -hmm. um, for about four or 500 spots, and they get about 5,000 people that right. want that job. That's not a shortage of workers that want that job. Now. Uh, the juxtaposition to that is Iowa, 
um, where you have uh, terrible workers' comp protections, you have terrible unemployment insurance, you have terrible OSHA, uh, you know, mm -hmm. state plan, state protections for safety on the job site. You have horrible collective bargaining rights. Right, the list goes on, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and they'll talk about uh, constantly the shortage of workers. And right. it's like now there's a shortage for workers that want you know gar garbage jobs, right. but there's no shortage for workers but that want a pension at 50 bucks an hour, and they have strong safety and strong collective bargaining. So that you know that that's mm -hmm. one part of it. Um, that uh, that that people forget, but the reality of it is, is yeah. I mean, you know, the the vast majority of people, uh, when faced with the decision, you know, do I support workers? Mm -hmm. um, of of course they do, right? That's that's the American way. All right, we've got to take a quick break, uh, but we'll be back uh, with you guys. Who are going to stick around for the next segment, so listeners, stay with us. We'll be right back with you. Uh, more workers, Mike, right here on seven twenty WGN. Welcome back, everybody, to the Worker's Mic right here on 720 WGN. I'm Ed Maher here with Phil Davidson, and we've still got our guest, Dave Sullivan, uh, lobbyist, former state senator, and uh, Mark Polis, the executive director of the Indiana, Illinois, Iowa Foundation for Fair Contracting. Um, so thanks for sticking around, guys. And, Thank you. Um, you know, getting into the segment before, we were uh, just talking a little bit about how um, some states are starting to turn on a little bit more of a worker friendly. Um, you know, pivot in even in Republican states where it's starting to make sense that not every working person is a Democrat, which I think our listeners can agree with, which I think the members of, you know, fill our various unions can certainly we can recognize certainly can attest to. Yeah, yes. there's there's a lot of diversity. And, um, you know, there's there have been a lot of uh, people just collateral damage over the years, um, taking, you know, damage from the uh, the party that they vote for. So, um, you know, I think when when you were a state senator, Dave, and there were, um, you know, there were pro-worker pieces of legislation that came through that you were supportive of, and you had to have conversations with your colleagues, did you ever have uh, resistance, or how did you kind of, how can you explain to someone that supporting workers is a good thing when maybe they've come in uh, and their past hasn't uh, hasn't always led them in that direction? Sure. Well, it was more difficult back then. Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that it's gotten easier. I think the Republicans have been more amenable right. to uh, recognizing that they really should be standing up for for workers' rights. I mean, I I was endorsed by the AFL-CIO when I was in office. I had constituents like Margaret Blackshear, the former president of the AFL-CIO, mm -hmm. Bill Dugan, head of Local right. 150, mm -hmm. and Frank Saul from, from Teamsters. So I, I, I wanted to have a great relationship with those constituents. I think I did. Um, and so I encouraged them to, those union leaders, to reach out to those other Republican legislators and start those relationships because it, it helps when legislators are here and back home that, you know, you're casting the right vote when you're doing something that's pro-union, pro-labor. I mean, I think we all appreciate the safety measures that are out there in the world and the 40-hour week work mm -hmm. week. Those didn't just happen. Right. Labor made those happen. So I think over the years... I would argue through the efforts of Local 150 and other entities, we have really helped educate Republican mm -hmm. legislators and make them more comfortable that they are doing the right thing. And I think the votes show it. You're, you're seeing a lot of bipartisan votes. Absolutely. And there are, there are a lot of unions that are very, very active um, in Springfield, pushing you know pushing various measures that are good for their members, good for workers that are not part of uh, party unions. So um, you know it's a it's a big it's a big effort in Illinois, and I think that's part of what makes Illinois so different. So. Um, we're just coming off the end of the general session, the general assembly. So, um, what happened this year? What were some of the the, the bigger sort of uh, key things uh, that pushed the ball forward for for workers in Illinois this year? I think one of the one of the biggest things was the I fifty five managed lanes. Okay, which, which we've got that kick started uh, procedurally because it's it's going to be a public private partnership. Okay, and such a big project like that is just not in the state capital budget. It's not going to be anytime soon. So, I drive 55 almost every day, and uh, it. I mean, there there should be money to fix it, yeah. but there isn't. So no. absolutely, you I could I, add I, 10 I, lanes to I-55. Yeah, still I, I drive in on the Kennedy, yeah. so that's fun. <laughs> but that's even worse. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I remind myself those are those are people working out there, and they're improving the economy and, and improving the roadway. So it's it's all a good thing. Yeah, going into work at local 150, I never complain about traffic. Yeah, that's no. for sure. If you're yeah. late because of traffic, <laughs> right? just keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Yeah. Say you overslept. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, so I think that, that I-55 managed lanes, um, interestingly, we got every Republican legislator to vote for that. Mm -hmm. Every single one. And that'll create a lot of jobs. Which is going to create a lot of jobs. It's a huge job, union job creator, yep. and all the Republicans were for it. 
Obviously, President Harmon and Speaker Welch were huge advocates for it, and they did a great job in getting it done. Mm -hmm. Without them, it it would not have happened. Um, But not every Democrat voted for it, but every Republican did. We needed that strong bipartisan effort. Right. Yeah, I'd, I'd say on that uh, House Joint Resolution 23, which was the I-55 managed lanes uh, piece of legislation, uh, interestingly enough, um, it was uh, it, an incredible um, force from the environmentalists, mm-hmm. um, uh, from the left, right. that, that really came out uh, much more on this thing against it than I've seen on, quite honestly, I think we we also lifted the moratorium on nuclear energy, <laughs> yeah, right? right, right uh, Senate right. Bill 76. Um, there was much more of a showing of force on the I-55 Manus Lanes Project right. than there was lifting the moratorium that had been in place for some 30-some years on, on nuclear energy. Yeah. So I'm still puzzled by it, but nevertheless, um, it, it happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, uh, you know, the, the claim was that this was, you know, there's these environmental justice communities that are going to be affected and it's going to create more greenhouse gases. But the reality of it is, is the only facts that were out there uh, was that um, CMAP, which mm-hmm. is the, the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the region, uh, and IDOT has looked at this project for years. They actually did an environmental study on this particular project. They actually found that the project will lessen greenhouse gas emissions um uh, so so interestingly enough those were the facts but mm-hmm. nevertheless uh, uh a bit of a problem uh from the environmental side of things nevertheless right it was the you know those challenges were overcome we passed it with wide margins bipartisan in both the house and the senate interestingly enough it's a joint resolution so it doesn't need the governor's signature right. um but this is like one step in a multi-step right. process to get to the public private partnership yeah you've got to study and yeah. see if it's gonna displace any um yep. you it know, allows for it essentially it, right? well yeah. yeah it authorizes the department of transportation to engage in this project as a public private mm-hmm. partnership right because as ed noted right uh, it's about a two two and a half billion dollar project um you know part of this is if if a if a if a partner comes in to manage these this this lane uh which would be a toll lane right mm-hmm. but you'd have free lanes as well so you could make, make the choice right do you want to take the toll lane or the managed la- or the uh, free lanes mm-hmm. um typically in the other seven states that have done these managed lanes uh the the partner has to take care of all the lanes so basically 355 to Dan Ryan, they got to take it all. Right. So they take that corridor over, and the free lanes have to look as nice as the paid lanes, right? That's usually part of the agreement, too. It sounds good for everybody. It does. Yeah. I mean, does. you drive on IDOT roads, all due respect to IDOT, <laughs> you got limited resources, uh, and you drive on the tollway, and it's like night and day, yeah. uh, you know, especially in the winter. I would like to mention, too, weather. that True. this is part of a bigger transportation picture. Mm-hmm. You know, we've been working, we're a partner in this I 290 Blue Line Coalition, right. which is basically looking at and trying to figure out how we actually do the bigger project, the five or six billion billion dollar project which is 290 mm-hmm. uh, right so from hillside basically all the way into the city uh, uh, you know that project has been looked at for years and years just don't have the funding for it right. so uh, we were actually successful this session uh, we front loaded about 300 million dollars in the budget uh, to go towards uh, engineering in that on this particular project and then we'll go for a mega uh, grant uh, from the federal government uh, next year as well, so we're we're we're, we're really we're really moving uh, on that as well. But you need traffic congestion relief yeah. for sure. if you start on that project, which would be I fifty five and I fifty five Manage Lane. It's hard to do two at the same time. You got it. So that, that's funny about the uh, the nuclear reactors because it it does seem like there is a divide amongst the greenies about nuclear energy because I mean it is it's green. It's a clean it's source. Yeah, it's it's it renewable. Is. A lot more electric um, cars. We're certainly in favor of it from the carpenters union perspective. That's a lot right. of work that goes into building those, a lot of scaffolding hours. And again, it, it does have a positive environmental impact, uh, according to some people. I know others would, would disagree. And people sit with the t- spent fuel and tailings, but in, no. In traffic for less time. Exactly. Less time spent in traffic. That's, I mean, who doesn't want that? Does anybody enjoy traffic? You don't want to go home at the end of the day. You're avoiding somebody at home. I don't know. No. Not, yeah, but don't even suggest that. the Swifties <laughs> tonight when they're headed back from the concert, <laughs> how they like mayhem. the traffic. Um, but I mean, Illinois this session also paid or passed uh, a paid leave act. Uh, paid well, not well, not this. They didn't. Uh, they didn't. They didn't get that far. So they didn't pass uh, okay. the paid leave. They they still being discussed. They entertained still discussed. it. Okay. Still a lot of moving parts in there. Uh, that is likely to come back up in the veto session, which okay. is now scheduled for uh, an end of October. Um, so that's likely to come back up. But yeah, a lot of discussions. They got very close. Senate President Don Harmon. I mean, this is like a, a you know a, a pinnacle in his career, right? He would really like to see this thing done, and he's going to see this thing through. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, a lot of negotiations this year, but didn't quite get to the finish line. Uh, One thing that I saw that uh, I think might not jump out as a 
as a pro worker, um, you know, policy, but it did to me was, uh, this push to have uh, full day kindergarten offered by all the public school districts in the state of Illinois by I think 2026. And I think in two ways, uh, we're trying to keep our kids in school, not in factories and slaughterhouses like they are in other states around us, but also <laughs> uh, to anybody who's ever had a kid that's in kindergarten, if you have half day childcare, you have to figure out dropping off late, picking up early, getting you know another childcare provider. If you can send your kid to kindergarten and know that they're there for the day, it opens up a parent to be able to go to work. Uh, and that brings in money. It also relieves the worker shortage, uh, you know, in certain industries. So it's uh, it's definitely a good worker policy. It'll be interesting to see how they, uh, you know, how they roll that out. They've got a couple of years, I think, right? Right. It, it, I think it's a great policy. Um, Governor Pritzker's for it. Freshman representative from Arlington Heights, Mary Beth Canty who is certainly a go-getter out there, right? I mean, she's, she is just sitting she's the ground running. She's yeah. doing a great job. She took this sponsorship on, and she it, she really made it a goal, and she hit that goal, did mm-hmm. a great job. I would like to point out, I'm in Naperville. We've had full-day kindergarten for, like, I don't know, a decade, right? So it's not, it's not a new thing in La-dee-da. the, uh, the West. You know, do you, did you bring your camera, Phil, because you might want to take it out because you've just spotted a person from Naperville bragging about how great it is in Naperville. Yeah, yeah. You, don't, a a you don't see a lot of those. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, you, you do see a lot oh, of those. Oh, that's right. I heard they like to talk about crime in Chicago as well in, uh, in Naperville. <laughs> we do. We, we, no, we talk about Sullivan Steakhouse oh, okay, and the Riverwalk. You know, we should come to Naperville. <laughs> We've Naperville. got fine, high-quality entertainment. Naperville, if you're listening to this, you just got a free ad. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Yeah. Um, but uh, I know there were a couple of improvements to the state's prevailing wage laws, which are important for uh, – it's a minimum wage for construction workers, and that's something that uh, that you work closely on with the Foundation for Fair Contracting, Mark. Again, with bipartisan support. Absolutely. I mean, wh- what other state – in the Midwest, are they are Republicans voting to strengthen prevailing wage laws to strengthen and expand, you know, good wage and benefit packages for union workers and for for all workers that are on public projects. So, I mean, that is uh, there. There are probably Republicans in other states who just don't understand what Illinois Republicans are doing. But we've shown that uh, it's good policy and it's it's good for the economy uh, when you have pro worker policies. Um, well, now, Ed, well, Ed, there's let's just let's just walk through quickly four pieces. Totally bipartisan, and mm-hmm. you would not see this in any other state. Uh, prevailing wage, codifying uh, prevailing wages at wastewater treatment plants for this removal of biosolids, right? It's kind of sort of, a, there's some anomalies in there, but bipartisan support to put that in the Prevailing Wage Act. Uh, there was a weird Illinois Supreme Court case on private rights of action under prevailing wage. Uh, again, we fixed the problem that mm-hmm. was identified by the Illinois Supreme Court and got bipartisan support uh, to fix that for private rights of action for prevailing wage. Uh, we have a new Supreme Court case uh, in this Glacier decision that mm-hmm. basically allows uh, uh, individual employers to file lawsuits uh, against unions and its workers uh, right. for strike-related activity. Uh, we fixed that even before the Supreme Court made the final decision and got bipartisan support for that particular bill. I want to I want to stop you there because um, it was, I want to say, Thursday this week that that decision came down. And the lawsuit was over uh, a concrete a strike by truck drivers in Washington, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. and uh, Teamsters. Right. And they uh, they went on strike and the concrete that was in the concrete truck spoiled and the state or the company tried to sue them. This this is the kind of thing that's federally preempted under the national labor law, the federal uh, National Labor Relations Act. It's a federal labor law that governs all private sector unionism. And uh, the Supreme Court took this up and just came in and, you know, took a machete to the Shocking. to to the existing law and said not only. Uh, no company go sue them if a, if there's any economic loss in a strike. Which I mean, what what strike? What's the point of having a strike if it's not going to go. cause economic loss? There's you've got to get attention. Um, they're also saying like, here's the roadmap to uh, get rid of the laws that govern this, so we can make it even worse for uh, for uh, for workers. But to your point, Mark, uh, this is something that's been coming down the pike. If the Supreme Court, you know, what they lack in uh, morals, they make up for in predictability. So <laughs> everybody knew this was coming. Uh, so the state of Illinois passed a law that uh, that sort of banned uh, what came out of this decision, the the, the state uh, court lawsuits to sue unions for financial damages during a strike. So that, uh, that passed. It was House Bill 2907, and uh, it passed. Governor's going to sign it, I assume, and... Uh, we're, uh, you know, it's uh, Illinois, again, sort of taking a lead where we're getting hit in the federal level. We're still stepping up at the state level to uh, to protect workers. So 
Um, yeah, yeah, Ed, a couple things there. One, uh, I would say that um, it's interesting to watch the National Labor Relations Board alongside the U.S. Supreme Court. Right. I mean, it could not be more strikingly different mm -hmm. um, that up. the Supreme Court has a blindfold on to the country yeah. of like, we see nothing. We'll take it from here. They're in Hold legacy mode, I was saying. Right? They're in, oh. like, this, these are the years like, I'm going to make my legacy. Apparently. And then the National Labor Relations Board on the other side is like, hey, look at what some of these states are doing. You know, having children serving liquor at 15, 16 yeah. years old. Having yeah. children in whatever it was, Kentucky or Tennessee at t the age of 10 uh, working. Others, right? Like this, yeah. you know, the National Labor Relations Board is like, listen, this, these whole non-compete agreements, these aren't okay. Hey, these mm -hmm. child labor things, these aren't okay. And then at the same time, you've got, you know, the Supreme Court over there saying, Oh sure, we've had sixty years of jurisprudence on 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 preemption and, and National Labor Relations Act uh, a preemption law, but we're gonna you know change it today. Yeah. Uh, it is Time to so go. Or, incredibly. You know, Clarence striking. Thomas's yeah. sugar daddy is not gonna pay for his next vacation <laughs> right. unless he pushes you know unless he, he writes the decision and uh, and votes the way he's told. Um, yeah, yeah. So. and I would say Ed, I think the facts of that Teamster case are are extremely important. Right. Listen, these were Teamster drivers yep. that were engaged in a labor dispute with between their union and their employer, and the union called the strike, and the the union truck drivers took the trucks back to the yard. They didn't abandon the trucks. Right. I mean, people think like, well, they abandoned these trucks and it was unlawful activity. They returned to the yard. They left kept the trucks spinning. there. They, left they kept the drums spinning so that the uh, concrete, concrete would yeah. not harden. Yep. And then they left the job they site because the job. they were now engaged in a lawful right. strike. Which is what you do. And they did what the they were damages to do, right? were less than a couple thousand dollars in actual concrete. And the Supreme Court thought the circuit court found this to be preempted. The appellate court found this to be preempted. Uh, the state Supreme Court found this to be preempted. Hey, why don't we take this up and yeah. find completely different than the entire Washington state uh, uh, court system and the 60 years of jurisprudence. When you see an opportunity to crush workers over at the old U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> yeah, let's take yeah, it. Yeah, do, it, take yeah, it. <laughs> do it with the sledgehammer. Yeah. 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 So, well, I've, I'll tell you what. We're, uh, I appreciate all the insight. I appreciate everything that you guys do. Um, but we've got to uh, take a break. Uh, thank you so much for coming back thank in. You. Everybody, you've been listening to thank you. Dave Sullivan and Mark Polis right here on the Workers' Mic. We'll be right back with you here on 720 WGN. Welcome back to the Workers' Mic on WGN 720. We are wrapping up the show here. I'm Phil Davidson with the Mid-America Carpenters Union along with Ed Maher from the uh, Operating Engineers Union. Mm. And we're going to, uh, before I go, I, I want to say something about, I, I read something recently about how the continued decline of membership um, amongst churches, amongst other associations, it's just people are just becoming more and more uh, isolated. Isolated, I think that's the word I was looking for, and spending time with themselves, spending time on their phone, um, mm -hmm. getting into uh, uh, harmful, dangerous habits, and it seems like it'd be a good time to help tell people, go to union meetings, man. Uh, unions really are like one of the last forms of community and association that people have. And um, for those members of my union, your union, any union out there, um, there's monthly meetings. Right. And a lot of times they'll feed you. Uh, yeah. You guys, you, you can... Talk about the good times. You can share grievances. Um, it's just a way to, to have that sense of community. You get to know what's going on. You get to ask questions. You're going to get answers. And um, I, I would just make maybe think like, really, I, there, there's few other mm -hmm. areas in life anymore where you get to hang out with like-minded people, go out, get together, and um, you know just share. No, you're, that's that's a point well made. I. Um... I never miss one of our union meetings. I enjoy it. Um, you know, you make a lot of friends. And honestly, you're in a room with people who do the same type of work as you do, deal with the same kind of hassles, uh, can probably help you when you're having trouble with things, personal life, professional life, whatever. I mean, union meetings are uh, are one of those last few places if folks aren't religiously involved or in, you know, some kind of, you know, Elks Club or Lions Club right. or whatever. Um Going to a union meeting is a great thing. So if you're a union member and you're out there listening, uh, when was the last time you were at a union meeting? If it's been a while, get back. Yep. There's only good things can come because if you're just sitting by yourself with your own thoughts, you know, fighting people on Twitter and uh, watching cable news, 
Nothing good's going to come of that. No. There's, there's already way too much of that you happening. Start going so. on rabbit holes. It's not healthy. Yeah. It's, it, you you got to meet with people. And, yeah, I, I, when someone goes to a union meeting, rarely do they walk out saying, oh, that was terrible. Right. You always, always get something out of it. You learn something or you have a chance to share something of your own with, with somebody else. So uh, I think that's a good call. Let's put it out to union members who are listening this week. Figure out when your next union meeting is and go and say hello to somebody. Yep. Find somebody to sit they're, next to. Make they're posted f- everywhere on yeah. websites, on social media. They're easy to find if you haven't been in a while. Yeah. And if you go to union meetings, take a friend with you. Find someone who hasn't and, uh, you know, take them, take them along with you. So uh, that's a very good point, Phil. Well yeah. said. Yeah, maybe in a future episode we can go a little more in-depth about union meetings because they are they're interesting. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a lot that goes on. Um, well, I'll tell you what, we had a great show today. Thank you again, Phil. Of course. And thank you to our guests, Dave Sullivan and Mark Polis. Um, time's getting short and we've got to get going, but uh, thank you to all the listeners for staying with us here this week, and we'll be back with you next Sunday right here on WGN 720 with more Workers Mike.